It's good to see you. Um, I'm Sébastien Treyer. I'm the director of IDRI, the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations. Um, so on behalf of I4C and IDRI, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, welcome you in the IDFC pavilion. Um, and really thanks to IDFC for having us. And I think it's an important place to be. Uh, so I'm not making uh, just uh, advertising for IDFC. But um, I think it's really a very important discussion that we have given the importance of the finance discussion everywhere here at, the, at COP27. Um, and I wanted to underline uh, that it's not just that the political onus uh, is on finance because of the promises that the, the northern countries have made, but it's also because, uh, of course, of the uh, financial situation that is extremely complicated for uh, vulnerable countries, least developed countries, but also lower middle income countries, those who were on the verge of emerging and have, have been really struck not only by COVID, but also by the consequences of the Russian war in Ukraine and uh, by, of course, the, uh, the amount of catastrophic events that are linked to climate change. The other thing that I think is really important and why finance is so central in this COP27 it's that uh, there are often a lot of underlying assumptions behind the idea that we, if we manage to have a step change on the amount and nature of finance that is uh, mobilized uh, for uh, the energy transition, this will also trigger lots of other mechanisms unlocking other dimensions that are uh, political, social, organizational, etc. And that was very striking in a study that we did with African colleagues in the framework of a, a platform of uh, sustainability think tanks between Europe and Africa called UKAMA. When we were analyzing the South African JETP, the South African Just Energy Transition Partnership, a lot of the assumptions was that if we managed to have a step change in finance, then it would unlock the political economy of change in the, in the electric sector. It would also change a lot of uh, social and organizational, uh, uh, it would also unlock a lot of other dimensions like social and organizational. And I think we need to also understand, I mean, that's striking to me and maybe a little bit out of the scope of this meeting, but on the uh, loss and damage discussion, a lot of discussion is, of course, about the fact that without finance, we can't do anything to repair the damages, but that to some extent people make the assumption that with finance, we are also going to be able to fix the social fabric that is really being impaired a lot by the uh, catastrophic events. And that idea that finance is central and can do miracles, I think we need to discuss that. And this is at the heart of this discussion today. This is why we have to unpack the three sessions that, are, that we have today about how is it that the way we look at long-term strategies to uh, really um, uh, align uh, in a pluralistic debate all uh, the different stakeholders, business, uh, fi uh, finance people, civil society, government, how this discussion around long-term strategies is one of the key elements through which the mobilization of new investment capacities is not just about having an investment plan, but also the capacity to unlock the changes that we need to have within the country and in the relation between the country and the external world. So this is why I'm really happy to be introducing this uh, session this afternoon. Um, again, thank you very much to the, all the strategic partners with whom we have organized uh, this meeting, the 2050 Pathways Platform, uh, IDB, AFD, and I'm really happy to uh, then pass the microphone to uh, Cassil Brunier from AFD, the NDC Partnership, and of course, uh, the co-organizers I4C. So thanks for being here. Um, now I pass the floor to Cassil. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure for, for us to share the introduction to this workshop uh, with Idri and uh, on the challenge of implementing long-term strategy, which is utmost importance to achieve carbon neutrality. Uh, Paris Agreements invites countries to formulate and submit long-term uh, low greenhouse gas emission development strategy with the objective of having a relevant framework at country level. So I, I'm here to talk, um, uh, among others, about our uh, 2050 uh, facility, which is m m one of my favorite tools in IFD, so uh, I'm very happy about that. It's a 30 million grants program, which aims supporting countries to map out feasibility pathway for long-term low-carbon and climate-resilient development. 
and the, to inform NDC revision, translation of strategy into sectorial planning, public policy and investment plan, and to build national capacity. This facility finance studies technical assistance in more than 20 countries, including Nigeria, Indonesia, India, South Africa, and with the support of many partners, think tank, National Research Institute, modeling team, and the leadership of country, and that's quite important. The objective is to build long-term dialogue on pathway, and it's in the um, title of the facility, uh, our, uh, our long term, our term is uh, 2050, and so it, it shows that uh, the idea is to project in, um, not tomorrow, not now, but uh, to go out from uh, uh, the, the, the actual uh, problem and see what it can be and what can we do for the long term. So uh, I will try to, to share with you uh, the first lessons we have uh, of uh, this uh, facility after four years of implementation. And uh, I have five, we have five um, recommendations and lessons that I can share. The first one is um, uh, that supporting long-term strategy requires a long-term dialogue. It, it, uh, it can uh, be um, evident, but uh, sometimes uh, with the political pressure, you can forget it, but uh, it's really not just a document. It's not just a study. It needs regular updates with the best available science, additional work to depend some analysis, and it has to be translated in policy, in investment action plan. This, this was the case in South Africa with the JETP, which a concrete example of implementation of thousand long-term strategy submit, submitted in 2020 to serve the net zero goal in a coordinated manner by authorities and the international community. Here at COP27, AFDA is implementing the French commitment by signing the first budget financing for, police, for public policy with South Africa, 300 million out of the 1 billion envelope promised in total. So this financing will support country authority effort in carrying out the reform necessary to achieve their climate commitment, to reduce inequality, and to restructure the electricity sector. This announcement demonstrates that one year after the signing the declaration at COP26, the partnership is delivering concrete result and effective funding. So this is the first lesson. It has to be long term. The second one is that formulating and implementing a long-term strategy needs a participative approach and stakeholder engagement to ensure country ownership and leadership. It's the second, but it could have been the first. In Colombia, more of 2,000 meetings were organized during 22 months of national consultation with the government, local authority, private sector, civil society, including indigenous co communities. The second panel of this workshop will highlight the specific role of private sector in the long-term strategy implementation and how deep decarbonizing pathway DDP are relevant for discussion with the corporate. Our third lesson is that engagement of key ministry and others and environment and development, economy, finance, planning is essential. So it has to mobilize more over the climate uh, the climate people in a country. Uh, as we know that the transition will require a deep transformation of economy with a strong impact on all the sectors, especially industry, agriculture, but also on society. It's a question of uh, transforming the society with job loss, reconverting thousands of workers, etc. Uh, our first lesson is that long terms need uh, to include not only low carbon aspect but also adaptation, social dimension to ensure sustainable development. In the Paris Agreement uh, in 2015, only mentioned mitigation aspect of long term strategy. It has been recognized uh, in the last IPCC report that the necessity to promote climate resilience development pathway that have been timely, anticipatory, integrative, flexible, and focused on action. This is the case for the recent long-term strategy formulated by Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, and Vanuatu 
the three financed by AFD with the technical support of GGGI and relays the, at the occasion for this COP, which takes in account climate risk and address vulnerabilities. The social dimension is crucial. Uh, we see how the just dimension is key to make the transition socially acceptable by the population and other donors partners are working on this by promoting a green job transition but also reinforcing social protection mechanism. Each country has its specific and solution need to be tailor-made. For example, we are supporting the University of Costa Rica to assess the employment potential in future net zero emission in Costa Rica. The analysis estimate job per canton, socio-economic region, development pool, and country for 144 economic activity. To give some example, the GEM modeling tool developed by AFD produced integrated study of socio-economic impact and climate change. So this, this uh, lesson is about, uh, it's not only scientific modeling and uh, projection, it's also about uh, changing the society. And uh, it, has, it has to be just so it, uh, it can uh, work. And the last lesson um, is uh, awareness building at national level in the only way to achieve a collective long-term mission in which all members of society are educated and empowered to make climate conscious decisions. Reinforced national, ministerial and research unit. Uh, it's very important uh, uh, in the long-term strategy that have been raised and become real with JETP, etc. The research in the country was mobilized and uh, in a lot of um, in a lot of cases, and especially in South Africa, they, it, it, uh, they had more influence. Uh, um, and more uh, and more action because of uh, because of res the research in the south. Technical uh, cooperation and capacity building are key enable to facilitate technology development. Uh, for example, the DDP project in Nigeria with IDRI, where building local capacity and working with national team is key to ensure ownership and success. It's particularly important to create a community knowledge. So as a conclusion, I would like to thank the organizer to, for this workshop, IDRI and I4C, also f uh, for their strong engagement and valuable work on this topic, which is not uh, easy. Uh, I would also like to thank countries' representatives, Nigeria, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and partners for the public-private sector who will share their specific experience of implementing long-term strategy. And lastly, I would like con to congratulate India for the, its very rich long-term low emission development strategy submitted in the UNFCC this Monday. Thank you very much. I think we can now go to the first session of this uh, third part, three-part uh, afternoon, and I give the floor to Louise uh, from uh, I4C. Thank you very much, uh, Sébastien. So, the first part of this event will be on the role of finance ministers in LTS implementation. Oh, sorry. Pardon? Ah, yeah, okay, fine. Um, so the question we ask ourselves at I4C, the Institute for Climate Economics, is really how you go from a national decarbonization roadmap or a long-term strategy to its effective implementation, so achieving a low-carbon and resilient economy. So we started with a diagnosis, and we found that there were four key challenges associated with uh, the implementation of long-term strategies. Oops. The first one is that um, long-term strategies are based on a 2050-plus uh, time horizon uh, with uh, intermediate time frames, and this is not the regular time horizon of political and administrative processes. So this is, this is difficult for them to address, sometimes because of political instability, but mainly because of the short electoral cycles. The second challenge is around LTS um, are based on uh, profound structural changes. So 
Today, most countries are already engaged in mitigation actions, are already supporting adaptation efforts. However, very few of them, I don't know if there's any, are really engaged in, uh, in the structural deep shifts of the economy which are needed to achieve the LTS targets. The third challenge is the lack of interministerial collaboration. So very often the long-term strategies are designed by the Ministry of Environment or the Ministry of Energy. Uh, with and, and the involvement of uh, finance ministers and other line ministries is often quite limited. So again, this could be a challenge for LTS implementation. And the fourth challenge is the fact that external factors um, can, uh, can happen and can shift the focus of public action uh, away from climate change. So as we see, this is uh, the case today when we see with the rising interest rates, rising energy prices, and which leads countries uh, who are, have released their LTS to actually engage in actions which go against the LTS. So for instance, we have uh, fiscal shields put in place uh, by many countries, including France. So we argue that a public finance strategy is needed as a first step towards LTS implementation. So first of all, uh, to bridge the gap between the short term and the near term objective. It's really not about making small incremental change for the next year, for the next five years. It's really about thinking the whole, the whole pathway to 2050. The second one, thank you. The second one is to, um, uh, why a public finance strategy is needed is to anticipate growing demand for public funding to support climate, climate investments and policy. So even if the cost of climate investments, climate infrastructure is likely to go down because of economies of scale or technical progress, the volumes will increase significantly and we think that the volume effect will dominate the price effect. So there will be more and more uh, demands on public funding for, for the climate. And it's, it's not only the fact that there will be more demand, but you also have to manage the, these demands over time. Thank you very much. Uh, so for instance, uh, you can imagine that for, for uh, projects which are not yet profitable, in the first time you'll need quite a lot of subsidies, but then as soon as it's profitable, you can let the private sector take over and then the focus will be maybe on another, on another type of, of, of investment. A third reason why a public finance strategy is needed is to reorient public, f public spending away from fossil fuels and towards climate action. So here tools can green budgeting can be, can be helpful if they cover both green and brown expenditure. So for instance, in France, uh, the green budgeting which was released at the same time as a draft finance bill back in September um, indicated that the, the fiscal shield uh, to protect uh, households from the rise in energy prices already represents 45 billion. So this is considerable. So, Third, um, third, way, th third reason why public finance strategy is needed. And the final one is to manage financial constraints at the government level. So we already argued that there will be uh, more demand for public spending for the climate. But then it's all about how do you fund this at the government level. So um, having an assessment of potential sources of funding, sources of re revenue which can be mobilized. So maybe putting an end or reforming fossil fuel subsidies, but also thinking about international finance, uh, green bonds, and, and other ways of, um, of bridging the funding gap. And for all these reasons, uh, we think this calls for a key role of finance ministers um, because they are uh, in the government, they're those who are the most used to thinking over very long time frames, uh, for instance, in the context of investment plans or when they think about pension plans. Often finance ministers hold, um, have the, the reins on the budget, so they're already used to working with different line ministries. Um, and also they have a, a very, very good view uh, of, uh, of government spending, government revenues, and all this. Oh. So, um, and so we, we, we thought about it a bit more. And so, and what should this public finance strategy uh, cover? So, a public finance strategy for the transition, we think, should cover at least three blocks. The first one uh, is an investment block. So, th we think this is a starting point, and it, I think it was a point which was um, mentioned by uh, Sébastien Treyer. Um, it's the, the finance. The finance is the one that will trigger the, the political economy. So here, what we mean by investments is that the LTS will provide information on wha what are the needed equipment, infrastructure um, to to reduce emissions. 
And here, having an, an estimate of all the, this investment needs can then help design the public policies in place. So here we go to the second block, public action. Given this investment gap, which public policies do you put in place? What type of support for investments? What will be the impact on national budgets? And then you have, of course, uh, the third block about what are the macroeconomic implications. Of course, LTS, as we said before, will, be, will represent like very deep structural shifts in the economy, which will affect uh, trade and other macroeconomic variables. And just as an illustration, so the starting point, and this is a work that I foresee has been engaged for a couple of years, is a, an assessment of the climate investment needs. So this is based on something that we release every year, which is called Climate Finance Landscape for France. And what we do is we look at the flows, the annual flow of climate investment in France. So this is a blue bar on the left. So in 2021, there were around 82 billion euros of climate investments in three key sectors, which are buildings, transport, and energy production. And then we compare these uh, current flows to the investment climate investment needs based on uh, here five uh, decarbonization scenarios. So the first one in black is a French uh, official roadmap, which is called the Stratégie Nationale Bas Carbone. And then, so we, you can see the gap um, to the investment needs is around 22 billion euros per year by 2030. And, uh, and then we, lo we also did the comparison with, with four other scenarios from the French Energy Agency. All of these scenarios uh, aim for a zero net emissions in 2050. And we can see that the investment gap is between 22 and 30 billion euros every year. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll give the floor to my colleague, Chloe, who will, um, who will present a, a tool we have designed to help finance ministers implement the LTS. Thank you. Thanks, Louise. Oh, okay. Does it work like this or? Okay, perfect. Um, so as Louise was saying, and now that we've established the need for a financing, sorry, a financing strategy for LTS, um, I want to present a tool that we've been working on at I4C, which is a dashboard to help finance ministers understand and assess the implications of LP LTS implementation. So um, as I was saying, the, the dashboard is really meant to contextualize, to contextualize national long-term strategies. And it can be, we made it to be a flexible tool so that it can be used in both developing countries and developed countries. So some of the key requirements that we had for the dashboard is that maybe something I should say first, it's a template, so it's not a model, so it will not run computations on its own. But so this allows us to create something that is really flexible. And so what we've done is that we created um, a tool that has indicators that are both um, relevant, robust, and also fillable. Um, we made sure that the dashboard would give out key insights on the LTS as well, and also that it would be user-friendly, so it takes the form of an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and finally, it, would, it is modulable to different national contexts, and it is modulable over different time frames. So as Louise was saying a little bit, the implementation of LTS takes place over different time frames, and we wanted to make sure that finance ministries could have that picture really clearly from the onset. And so maybe something I would like to mention is that for this project, we received the support from the 2050 Passway platform, which is hosted at the ECF. Um, so to develop this tool, we went through a three steps approach. We started with a literature review to understand a little bit what was done and what was published on the impact of LTS implementation on public finance, but also macroeconomic concerns. We realized that not so much was done at this stage. So we moved on to um, hosting interviews with key stakeholders, some of which were within ministries of finance, so practitioners. Uh, we had interviews with roughly six countries. We also had interviews with other key stakeholders, so CSOs, um, um, academics, for example, and international organization. This really helped us frame the context for the project and understand a little bit more how our tool would be helpful. And finally, we went through internal and external reviews of the tool before moving on to properly creating the, the dashboard that I will present to you after. Um, so here's what we got from interviews while we were preparing the, the project. So really, we, we, pr we believe that we've produced a tool that can be helpful to mainstream climate issues within ministries of finance that are at this stage not fully aware of LTS contents and LTS um, uh, of LTS um, constraints as well. And we wanted to make sure to highlight the challenges and the opportunities, the economic opportunities that can ensue from the full implementation of LTS. 
Um, so the idea is really to have a tool that can help mainstream LTS within teams that are not working on climate issues within ministries of finance. Um, so the tool also will is, has been designed so that it can help and can serve as the basis to develop a financing strategy, sorry, uh, to develop a financing strategy as Louise was explaining and um, foster interagency collaboration. Okay, so we've also identified several users for our tool. There will be information providers. So those um, are usually people within ministries of finance, bureau of statistics, um, ministry of the environment, etc., that can provide information that will be helpful for, for ministries of finance later on. Um, other users are analysts that will propose policy options for the implementation of the LTS. And finally, we have decision makers. So decision makers will use the dashboard to um, understand how to best implement the LTS and also understand how they can both revise or design LTS themselves. So get involved in the process. This is a really important part. Okay, so um, I will move on now to an overview of the dashboard, sorry. Um, so we've split it into four tabs. As I was saying earlier, it's an Excel spreadsheet, so it doesn't have any macros. It's, it's pretty straightforward. But basically, we have four tabs. The first one is an overview of the LTS. It's really meant to familiarize users with the contents of the LTS, which they may not know from the onset. The second tab is on climate investments, so all the investments needed to trigger the real economy changes that are laid out in the, in the LTS itself. The third tab will be on the policies and financing that are needed to trigger said investments, so to trigger the climate investments. And finally, we're looking at macro implications of LTS implementation. Um, if we go in a little bit more detail, so the first tab really will, will just bring back, um, will we'll summarize all the goals laid out in the LTS at different milestones, both on the, on the dimension of adaptation, mitigation, but also development. Um, and then we, the, the tab will also help highlight areas that may not have enough information in the LTS. So this can be helpful, especially if you're trying to revise the LTS. And finally, this tab is really helpful to, to start translating or to prepare the work for the translation to climate investment, to which I'm coming right now. So when we're talking about climate investment, what we're looking at in, in, the, in the file is current and planned investments for the transition, both on the mitigation and adaptation side. And we're also looking at investments that are harmful for goals laid out in the LTS. Overall, this provides an overview of um, the, the investment gap and also the areas that need to be reformed. For the policies and financing, so as I was saying, it's really trying to think about the, cur the current or planned policies that will trigger the investments needed for the implementation of the LTS. And so what we're looking at um, is both uh, an overview of every existing policy in the government, as, as much as users can fill it, but also public spending, well, so sorry, uh, public spending that is related to those policies. So here we're getting a little bit closer to what Louise was mentioning earlier, which is a green budgeting process. So we're looking both at um, positive or environmentally friendly spending, but also harmful spending that needs to be reformed. And finally, in this tab, we're also looking at sources of funding for uh, policies and other actions that need to, be, to take place at the governmental level. So when we talk about funding, we're looking at fiscal revenue, but we're also looking at debt, for example, debt instruments. And so finally, um, we have the macro implication tab so we understand that LTS being what it is and requiring rec real economy changes, we, we see that it will have an impact on uh, GDP, it will have an impact on key sectors of the economy or on the structure of the economy. These impacts need not to be um, negative, but they need to be managed by finance ministers, especially as they pertain to the long term. And so we really wanted to highlight key elements to, to be considered, so um, output, other socioeconomic indicators, debt, prices, so consumer indices, for example. Um, currencies, it's, it's particularly relevant for developing countries and foreign exchange balance, for example. And trade, trade indicators. So this is what we have as a bit of an overview. 
we anticipate some challenges in uh, when countries are trying to fill this dashboard in the first place. We understand that it requires a lot of information and that in the alpha version, it is quite unlikely that everyone will be able to, to fill the dashboard, even a very developed country. So we completely encourage versioning for, for that purpose. And um, there are obviously solutions that are built in the dashboard so that we so that countries can you know start using it even if they have very limited amount of information so we have indicators that are easy to fill and it goes we have three levels it goes from easy to difficult and then we also have levels of priority for the indicator so we rank the priorities from highest to lowest there's again three levels and this will help uh, users get a first good picture um, with indicators that are relevant and so we have a report that has been published on this. We also have a short video to explain a little bit more the, the, um, uh, the, the rational for this project. And very soon, we're going to publish the dashboard as well as a user guide. So that's it for me. Um, and I will leave the floor to Marcella for a short panel. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Luis and Chloe, for giving all this context for this conversation that we are now going to have, um, a brief panel to hear from different perspectives precisely on this topic on LTS and investment planning and these type of tools to engage um, public finance um, uh, policy makers. So I am very, very pleased to invite here to, to join me in the panel, um, Joanna Arriagada. Uh, lead of um, uh, capacity building in the Ministry of Environment of Chile. Please join me here. We also have Susan Oldbridge, a climate policy specialist at UNDP. And online, we should have Pak Noor Siafundi, a senior policy analyst from the Center of Climate Finance and Multilateral Fiscal Policy uh, in Indonesia. Can I just confirm that I have you online and can you hear as well? Excellent. Yes, yes. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Okay, so basically we just wanna start to, to hear from different perspectives on this conversation that we just started here. Um, actually, I, I would like to start with you, uh, Pak Noor. Uh, we know Indonesia is, is a leading country. You have been doing a lot of work on planning um, the low carbon, the net zero transition, and the climate resilient transition. And you have also advanced a lot of tools and planning on the financing side, on the public sector side. So we are really, really curious to know, if you can share with us, well, how is Indonesia approaching the financing of the transition uh, to low carbon and resilient economy over time? And, and how you are engaging with different stakeholders on that process of the financing and implementation? Yes, uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity. So called upon to... Uh, for sure, uh, based on our uh, NDC and and as you already know that uh, Indonesia has uh, expressed our enhanced NDC uh, towards uh, 2030 and also we have a commitment to uh, reach a nuclear emission by 2060 or sooner uh, with our long-term strategy on uh, low carbon and climate resilience uh, 2050. So then based on that, uh, our government uh, had uh, how much the investment cost that we really needed uh, to achieve that the target. And so far, uh, based on our uh, third PUR, uh, it mentions that uh, we will need uh, about uh, 4,000 uh, Indonesian rupiah uh, to reach uh, the, uh, our, our NDC. Even that's uh, our commitment at, at 29%. And uh, from that, uh, so we like provide a strategy on how we may manage uh, different uh, sources of uh, financing. The process uh, coming from uh, domestic that uh, consists of the state budget and uh, non-state budget. And from the international, uh, we define there are uh, two kinds of process. Uh, it's coming from bilateral and multilateral. And uh, from the state budget, uh, based on uh, our uh, like uh, quite quite a uh, few times, yeah, we. We conducted um, what is so-called as the climate budget taking, where uh, from that we, we acknowledge uh, our government spending uh, 
uh, dedicated for uh, mitigation and adaptation. Uh, the initiative uh, started by 2016, and today uh, uh, we uh, we also have uh, expand uh, the climate budget taking for uh, gender responsive as well as on the regional level since uh, 2020. And uh, from the state budget, we have uh, uh, different uh, initiatives as well, that, like uh, we provide uh, fiscal transfer for uh, regional government, and we. Uh, since uh, last year, uh, we have a law number uh, seven uh, mentioning that uh, we will have uh, the carbon tax. And uh, on the financing uh, uh, sources, uh, we have uh, the green, green finance. Uh, put, uh, we have a green stock that has uh, been introduced by 2018. And uh, last year, we also introduced what the so called uh, SDG one. And today, we are working quite uh, strong uh, with different stakeholders to provide uh, what the so-called as uh, blue financing. I, we, we still have no uh, no certain uh, decision that uh, we will use either to cook or bond uh, in the, the coming future. We, uh, from, from the non-state budget, we have uh, different sources so far, and uh, we have uh, we are expecting a carbon uh, trade in the future and uh, there are coming there are also different sources like from uh, state on enterprises, from the public service agency, like uh, the environment, uh, Indonesia Environment Fund, and we also have a different kind of uh, capital market that we expect uh, can also support uh, the uh, climate finance. And from the international, uh, from the multilateral, our office, uh, fiscal policy agency, fiscal policy agency is uh, our national uh, designated authority for uh, green climate fund and we have different kind of uh, other uh, multilateral agency that are uh, working with uh, relevant government agencies like uh, global environment facility as well as adaptation fund and different uh, MPPs and uh, international financial institutions uh, can also working as our international uh, sources to also finance uh, our climate in Indonesia. Uh, that is uh, uh, from different uh, different sources source of finance, but uh, from the fiscal policy, uh, actually we have uh, different approach as well. From the uh, revenue, we provide uh, different levy uh, that also can be like uh, put it into the economy and, and can be financed different different uh, environmental and climate uh, action uh, in the in the public level, and we also have. Uh, different tax facilities or incentives like tax allowance or tax holiday to support the uh, investment in uh, uh, renewable energy and also in uh, uh, electric vehicle. There is a uh, problem and uh, in, in terms of how we, we also engage with different stakeholders uh, from, from the uh, sort of finance in terms of uh, the mitigation and adaptation, we are working quite close uh, with the different both uh, land ministries as well as uh, the international organization that we, we uh, may able to like uh, benchmark and, and uh, gather different different uh, ideas on how we may manage our uh, uh, climate finance uh, in, the, in the future. And then uh, that's why we have uh, today uh, different innovative financing even coming from uh, uh, different initiatives uh, with regard to the uh, we can we can call it uh, climate budget taking as well as uh, the uh, different uh, different uh, initiatives that have been uh, conducted previously. Then from me, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, you touched very many uh, relevant issues. Like it was good to understand how you are seeing these different sources of finance. You working at the national level with different policy and instruments at the national level, but also you have all the international ecosystem coming together to to join forces in in other areas. And well, working with line ministers, which was one of the messages that we heard at the very beginning about one of the key. Um, actions that need to happen to enable that transition, the action on the ground. So thank you very much for that. Uh, but I now would like to, to move to another area of the world. <laughs> 
Chile, another uh, leading country, you have already submitted your long-term strategy with your carbon neutrality objective, with your climate and resilience uh, adaptation, and the country has been working also for long in all the aspects of financing and implementation. So we will also be very happy to hear from Chile, how is Chile approaching this uh, financing and implementation element of, of, of the strategy, and how you're engaging with different actors within the government and outside. Yeah, thanks Marcela for the question. Uh, well, in Chile, um, in the last June, June, we have published our climate change framework law. So now we have all the framework, the public framework, to implement uh, different instruments, sectoral mitigation plan, sectoral ad adaptation plan, but also at regional and local level. So the law established very clear the responsibilities to do, to do these all instruments by the sectoral ministerials, but also by the regional government and local government. We need to have 16 regional action plans and 1,350 local plans in three years. So we have a lot of work to do right now. We are working, we are working the reglements I think it's uh, that will work. And in financial, our law now gives the responsibility to our mi Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance should coordinate all the economic instruments that we will use at the national level. In the last year, we are, uh, I think in 2020 and 2021, we are designed our long-term strategy. And as the presentation before, we have a lot of goals. And yeah, and yeah goals, I think we have like 14 sectors there, and each sector has like five goals, uh, five objectives, and the, each objective has, I don't know, three goals. So. It's a big, big instrument, and and yeah. Now with the plans, with the sectoral plans, we need to go to the action of how we will reach these goals and and plans. So yeah, we have a lot of work on that. And uh, in, the, in the financial uh, aspect, we use different instrument. Uh, we use uh, the main is the debt. Economical, economical instrument, we, we use the green bonds and also uh, result payments for uh, doing the biggest investment. For example, for transport, we need to enhance our train system and we need also to enhance our houses with energy efficiency standards, with solar panel, with um, with water by solar, I don't know the, <laughs> the world, but uh, that I think is the biggest investment that we have. But we also have uh, so uh, many projects with the financial mechanism of the convention, with the Green Climate Fund, with the Global Adaptation Fund, with the GCF, and other bilateral uh, support with the banks, with the Euroclima Plus, and other donors. So we. I think we are using all the instruments that we can use. We have also the green tax, but it's not directly to climate change action. We, uh, in, at the national budget, we have like a big, uh, I don't know, we have like a big bus uh, back with all the money from the country, and there is also the green tax. And now with the implementation, implementation of the law, the uh, national budget give also to climate action or the climate design of the policies mainly. So we try to use all the economical instrument. And we also have, I remember the last part of the question, uh, we have like a technical interministerial uh, group where all um, ministerial are in participating in this group and we are coordinate all the activities in all the ministers so all the ministries so we have uh, this group from um, science 2015 so we have some experience with with them so we are continuing working with them
Thank you. And um, I, I think in Chile it's very interesting to see the institutional structure that has been put in place. Like you were saying, since 2015, you are already having this engagement group, but also very relevant the climate change law that you have, and that actually gives very much clarity about who is responsible for what, and giving that clarity on the role of Minister of Finance, so they can also be clear about what is it that they uh, need to be doing in this process. So I think that's super interesting, and thank you for sharing that. Um, so now I'm going to move to Suzanne. So, um, so we were listening at the first panel about the relevance of these investment plans, and we hear all the time here about the needs of these investment plans, but we know many countries have been working on them, we know there is some experience on that, and we know UNDP has been working with many countries on this area, and moving on implementation, so it would be great to know a little bit like how are you supporting countries on these aspects, and what is the experience, what have you seen, where are where, where we are with these investment plans. So please, go ahead. Excellent, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. And I'm really so happy to hear about the experiences both from Chile as well as from Indonesia. It's also countries that we are working very closely with, um, working with the United Nations Development Program. And also, yeah, the support that I'm going to outline is also very complementary with what we heard from the previous speakers. We heard Louise uh, speaking about uh, tools that need to deliver structural changes, about uh, still some lack of interministerial engagement that we see in many countries. Um, and there was Chloe outlining about the dashboard and the various steps about that. And really, our work at UNDP is very much aligned with that also. And I think that speaks to the fact that I think we are all seeing um, certain challenges that countries are faced with across the board and we are trying to find ways to assist countries on how to address them. Um, and at UNDP we are doing a whole range of different things but I am just picking one example here on how we are supporting on this finance aspect. And this is, so UNDP seeing that there's countries often struggling with this bottleneck of implementation. So typically we have an LTS or um, a nationally determined contribution that sets out a quite high level target of what should be done, but then really for a country to go and implement and break it down into more concrete steps of action, this usually comes with a whole number of questions like, how much will that cost? From what sources would that come from? What are actually the real like, implementation and action and steps that this overall target would translate into? So to help countries address these questions, we have come up with an approach for countries to do financial assessments with the idea to go beyond listing these are the overall costs, but really saying, okay, what finance is already being spent within the country, domestically, public uh, finance, public budget, private finance, household finance, and in what way can this be first allocated in a more efficient way to make sure that we are not just subsidizing the brown agenda and not having uh, perverse incentives, but really moving towards financing a green agenda and then on top of that see what is additionally needed um, to implement our LTS or our nationally determined contribution. Um, the way this typically works is that countries develop with us um, two financial scenarios for the future. One is a business as usual scenario, just continuing um, what's happening right now into the future. And the other is really a target scenario that says, okay, if we are really going to seriously implement our LTS or our NDC, then this is what will be needed. And then really from seeing the differences in these two scenarios, countries do not only see, oh, this is the big gap that we have, but really see like what is the way to move towards a target scenario. So what would be needed by when and from whom? And what types of technologies we need to shift or what types of sectors we need to shift? So um, I'm saying that to say that um, countries who have been doing that typically um, tend to benefit in two ways. On the one hand, um, being more efficient with um, domestic finance, um, and on the other hand, also having better chances in mobilizing international finance. Because, of course, it typically makes a difference if a country can say, we need exactly so and so much to do A, B, C until this and this, by this and this sources, rather than saying, we need much, we don't know exactly how much. So, um, of course, there's much more to say about that. I'll, I think I'll stop here, uh, just to say that um, these, 
these financial assessments probably just to close. Um, of course, this is not just a purely technical work. Of course, it has a data side, it has a scenario side, but of course it also um, implicates uh, the policy side. So that means uh, ministries across all the different uh, key line ministries need to be engaged, not only Ministry of Environment, we need to have all this buy-in and also um, by doing this, countries are really making the business case for action because it also shows if we do not act, this is how much it costs. It's not just we are costing how much climate action costs versus there is nothing, no other cost, but this is the cost that occurs if we do not act. Um, right, I think I'll, I'll stop here um, yeah, and hand it back. Thank you, thank you very much. And I definitely, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea of uh, how this um, planning, this long term strategies planning, can then help understand the what, by when, and who. And I think we heard a lot of examples, like from Chile, you were talking about all the specific measures and the who is in the law, uh, and so now working on how is much different, right? Because you have some. Uh, specific areas and similarly we're hearing from Indonesia quite a lot of specificities about what it means for them to to, to, to move ahead. So um, we, we this is a short panel, we're very close to the end so we have very few time left um, but we have a final question for the three of you and uh, and um, we I'll basically like to go back to Pagnor but um, I would like to hear from you um, what are the main challenges that you're still encountering on the finance inside and how do you think a tool like the final dashboard that was just presented today could be helpful uh, to address some of those challenges? Yes, thank you. Uh, for sure that uh, in terms of the capacity, we have uh, very uh, limited capacity. Based on uh, our uh, study, uh, it shows that uh, uh, to meet uh, the 29% uh, target of our NDC uh, with, uh, with the current situation uh, from uh, the public and uh, private uh, finance. Uh, we, there are still uh, about 40% gap to, uh, to meet uh, that 29% and becoming more, uh, it's about 55% uh, uh, as we uh, try to achieve uh, the 41% uh, the, the conditional uh, target. So then, uh, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, we also have uh, various uh, challenges. Uh, the first is how uh, we may uh, optimize the, mobi the mobilization of the non-state budget uh, of the climate change uh, funding sources. And uh, we need to also that uh, after the uh, COVID, so we need to like uh, ensure that the economic recovery and uh, transition to uh, uh, green economy is uh, just and uh, affordable. And then uh, we also need uh, to strengthen uh, the uh, viability of uh, green projects so that uh, they can be financed uh, by the financial sector and uh, receive uh, international support. And uh, about uh, the dashboard that already that uh, that is uh, being presented by uh, our colleagues from uh, IFOC. I think uh, it's in line with uh, our uh, medium uh, strategy in the future. Yeah. That uh, we also uh, willing to provide uh, the climate finance dashboard in in, uh, in the Ministry of Finance of Indonesia. Uh, and even today, uh, working together with uh, our colleagues from uh, UNDP, uh, we are preparing uh, the link between uh, the uh, climate budget taking with uh, the uh, register, uh, the, the MRP system in the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry. So then, uh, after that, uh, we are moving on how we may also like link uh, the climate finance, uh, I mean public climate finance, to uh, different uh, innovative uh, policies uh, related to the, uh, the, the carbon, including uh, the carbon pricing that uh, in the future we are expecting it's uh, uh, coming, uh, becoming uh, prominent uh, in the future. And also, uh, we are uh, today preparing uh, different innovative uh, policies, including uh, just like uh, the uh, 
the master of ceremony mentioned that uh, uh, we are preparing the energy transition mechanism as well as, as, well as uh, different uh, financing uh, including blue and uh, biodiversity that uh, will also give uh, impact to uh, our our NDC and uh, NZA, uh, NZA government in the future. So I think uh, some, some tools that uh, uh, like uh, may answer both uh, the micro and macro level of uh, 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 perspective yeah, uh, will be very beneficial for, for us, uh, for, for the Ministry of Finance, uh, particularly uh, for Fiscal Policy Agency of Indonesia, I think, yeah. And then, uh, based on that, so may, we, we may like uh, provide uh, different uh, policy recommendations based on that, that uh, kind of dashboard. So, so uh, in which uh, we need uh, to strengthen uh, our, our policies and the sector that uh, need more support uh, from the Minister of Finance. So I think uh, something that handy, but uh, may okay, provide a very, very uh, complete and comprehensive uh, 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 policy scenario uh, will be very, very uh, fruitful for, for the uh, policy recommendation preparation uh, for us. Then, uh, we'll be very happy uh, if uh, we have the opportunity to learn more about this dashboard group and then uh, we may uh, working together uh, with, with, with that dashboard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for highlighting some of those areas that may be more relevant to further development or the macroeconomic area. Definitely uh, an area where we want to deepen a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, now I'd like to go to Joanna, same question really, what those main challenges and how do you think this dashboard may be useful um, for that, to addressing those challenges? Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, our law established a goal to reach carbon neutrality and resilience to, 2000, to 2050. But also we have a lot of principles that integrate the transversal approach in all the climate action, like uh, climate justice, gender equality, uh, based nature solutions. Uh, so we have different transversal approach that now we need to connect with the projects and bring finance for those projects. So it's a very difficult challenge that, that we have. And we also in the parallel, at parallel we have a, a decentralization process in our country to give more capacity to all our region and territories. So we need to enhance local and regional capacity to understand how uh, mitigation action they can implement, what adaptation action they can implement, and which are the financial mechanisms that they could accede. So it's very difficult to, to advance if we don't have capacity at the local and regional level. So maybe I, we are thinking that maybe it's, uh, we need to develop some, some kind of, of draft of of project proposal that we can implement at the local level because uh, sometimes needs are very similarity between different territories. Beco uh, for example, in, in energy, transport, we have some kind of similar project. So maybe we, we can have some like an, a basis of draft proposal that, uh, that regional and local level can start from there. To with the and add their specific realities and needs, so maybe that I think is our most challenge. And in this sense, uh, with the Ministry of Finance and also with the Development Regional sub Subsecretary, we have like a, a work group where we invite also all the regional governments to work together and look a financial way to move forward local and regional projects. Yeah, I, that I think it's our most yeah, challenge. And we also have a challenge about the um, green taxonomy, because maybe we have a lot of projects and their UNDP has a role in, uh, you are supporting the Ministry of Finance on that. And we are working all with Ministry of Finance, Financing, and we need to 
uh, define which type of project will be uh, or will be contribute to the mitigation goals and adaptation goals because uh, that in this moment is not so clear um, some parts think that some projects are uh, will be helped to us to reach the goals but maybe uh, we have some problem with adaptation or climate risk so we need to analyze all the things together yeah. Thank you. And, and that last point actually may be an area where we can look into more detail and see how a tool like this could be helpful in that conversation. But definitely as well the subnational level is something that keeps coming up quite strongly. Uh, but then as Susan, also in the experience that you have had supporting many countries as well, what are the main challenges that you have found that they are facing and how do you think a tool like this could be helpful? Yeah, thank you a lot. I mean, definitely we have seen a lot of changes. Yeah, let's be frank. And I mean, and they come on so many different levels also, right? I mean, all across the different aspects of reality. I mean, we are navigating so difficult times. So obviously we are living through an ongoing pandemic. We are seeing political instability. We are faced with like inflation and high rising food and fuel prices, disrupted supply chain. So there's a lot that governments already have to deal with. And then yet, it's so important to act on finance and to pay for finance action. And so um, these financial assessments are a part of what we are trying to, how to address it in terms of helping countries to give them arguments why it can make also economic sense to act on climate. Um, but as said, this is just one aspect out of several others that we also do. So for instance, another challenge that we see in many countries is that they want to more systematically engage the finance sector in being green and in contributing to climate rather than like being opposed to climate. Um, so many countries are looking into how to set up green bonds. So we have um, brought together with some other experts a training on green bonds that is accessible to everyone, that's open uh, and that countries or anyone, any of us, can do uh, to get a, a clearer idea how to move ahead on green bonds. Um, then also what we see and what was mentioned already, still it's often a challenge to get a diverse range of ministries and ministers um, engaged in the climate uh, action and so uh, UNDP is supporting to address that um, with countries on the finance ministers for climate action coalition also. So um, one other thing that we are doing is um, working with countries because we see especially on, energy, uh, on addressing climate change uh, big topic for many countries is moving ahead on the energy transition and so we see that often for investors they see a too big investment risk to really go at scale into the energy sector so that's another area of support where we are trying um, to support countries to help them um, de-risk investments uh, associated with the energy sector. Um, then another thing is obviously private sector engagement so of course public finance will have to be a big part of it but of course also we see that the need to um, engage the private sector so for instance the green commodities program from UNDP we are trying um, to bring together producers in a very pragmatic sense to ensure that also supply chains are being greened um, yes and I think this with this I'll come to close thanks Thank you, thank you very much to the three of you. And I think I was very, it was very interesting to hear all the different experiences. And also always very interesting to hear when we're talking about investment planning and financing. Um, we hear from all of you, not only the part of actual projects and how we structure those projects and what could be the financial instruments, but we heard a lot about the policy side as well. Like all of you mentioned that as well as a very key complementing area. So it's something that definitely go hands in hand um, together with a lot of issues on the capacity on the ground and how to bring it to different actors. So um, I, will, I will close the panel there. I was really glad that you were all here. Thank you so much for sharing. And just a big round of applause for our panel, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I'll give the mic to, yes. Thank you, Marcela. Hi, everyone. Um, 
We will now move to the second part where we will talk about the, the engagement of the private sector. So in this part, we will, uh, we will do it in two, in, in two, two, two main uh, two sub parts. The first, I will uh, just put on the table a few elements for the discussions, and then we will continue on a, on a panel mode of, uh, of exchange. Uh, but before, I would like to, to thank uh, the French uh, Facility for Global Environment that actually supported uh, a project that we have been doing, so the DDP initiative with the ACT initiative. And actually, most of the elements that I will present today as key insights are coming from lessons from this project that we just finished this year. So um, I, I wanted to, to thank uh, again the FFM for, uh, for their support. And before to start, just to remind that the origin of this project was to recognize that, I mean, the Paris Agreement recognized that there were two dynamics, the state dynamics for climate ambitions with the NDC's uh, cycle, but also the non-state actors dynamic. And it was back in 2017 when we came to FEFEM and say, hey, we have a research project, we feel that today it's too disconnected between these two types of actors and we want to build a research project and they were almost the only one to, to believe at that time that this was a relevant topic to work on. So again, thank you for, uh, for them for supporting us on this. And now let's move directly to the content. So I will, I will pass these slides because my colleague after Marta, I'm sure, will talk about the DDP, uh, the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Initiative a bit. So. Uh, I don't know where. Thanks. And I will so just provide, as I told you, like a few elements for the discussion that we will have after. So first, I think it's important to take a step back and look at where we are when we talk about private engagement. So these are just a few numbers to keep in mind. You know, the, the, the science-based targets uh, are clearly the first step that the companies enter in. I mean, they, they were setting targets like, like it's similar to the countries in a way. Um, and clearly, these are a few numbers that are interesting to check. Currently, is that we see a, a, a strong increase indeed in setting targets. But if we look at uh, what they report, first, there is an insu insufficient report on target progress, which means that when they set a target, then there is no follow-up on where they are uh, on, this, uh, on this target. And the, the second one is that actually, in uh, many of the cases, they are lagging behind. I mean, a, a quarter, only 50% of the cases, they are really on track. So these points are just there to explain a bit on some facts why there is a growing concern on the credibility of those targets and some criticism of greenwashing. And as you know, at the beginning of this COP this year, uh, we had the launch of the, let's say, of the first year of the report of the, the UNSG Expert Peer Review Group that works uh, on, the, on the, the integrity of company transition plans and company commitments. So, and I will make the link now with the corporate climate transition plans. In a way, this is the DDP, a DDP type, a corporate type of DDP. That means it's exactly defining a pathway to reach their goal. So the first point was setting target. We have seen a bit where they are. And now we have seen an emerging agenda since a few years on this question of the corporate transition plans. And the ACT initiative that I mean, we have been working with is exactly working on this question of assessing transition plans. So I will, we will focus a bit of the discussion on this question of transition plans or pathways, but from a corporate pathways. So what are the elements on this? So clearly, no, I would like to be back. Thanks. <laughs> I, I, will, I will make you a sign. Thank you. Um, so clearly on the, on the definition, so you see the, the clear objective of the corporate transition plans are really to help companies to align their business model. So this is really the core idea, so to describe how they are going to reach their goal. Again, if we look at the first number we have, which are not that good, the first point is that CDP has done a work on looking at the transition plans or looking at the, the, the information that the company reported to them. And only one third of the 4,000 companies that are reporting to CDP, only one third of them are saying or reporting that they are developing a transition plan. So many of them are yet in the situation of setting a target, but you know, transition plans maybe later. Um, 
Another point that also we has been raised in other projects and in ours when we were doing it in Brazil and Mexico is the difficulty to access to some information. I mean, clearly, when we try to assess some transition plans based on public data, it was horrible. I mean, we had uh, almost no, no information. And when we tried to engage bilaterally to get more information, it was yeah, a hard work that Rebecca will maybe tell a word after, because that's what uh, our colleague from CDP Latin America in this project tried to, to do in, in uh, reaching uh, uh, yeah, out to the companies and having all of the information. And I wanted to emphasize, as I mentioned, the UNSG high-level expert group report that has been published last week, that among the key recommendations that they are putting on the table, there is the mention of detailed transition plans. So I, I will now move to that point of saying what is or what should be a detailed transition plans, but I will not, to be sure, detail too much, please. And the situation, the landscape that we are seeing today is that there are different reporting standards, but let's say no clear only one. So here are a bunch of, of initiatives, I will not enter into the detail, but initiatives that try to qualify and work on this question of what should be the indicators of a transition plan, what should be in, what should be provided in order that we are able to assess uh, the integrity of their commitments. Uh, we have been working with ACT that I mentioned uh, just before, but there are a few. So the, the, the elements that is important to keep in mind are the two ones here. What we have seen in our project is that in most of the cases, the different indicators that we asked company to report, they were not able. I mean, in many of them was dif really difficult to access them. So which means that in terms of the content, it was what we say too ambitious in many cases, but the, the big issue that we see in the next coming years is that current standards are ongoing. As you may know, at the international level, there are some standards at the, at the European one by 2025 and internationally, uh, the ISB is also a future international standard that will put some clear guidelines on what are the elements of transition plans that should be in. And the ACT initiative actually worked uh, in this international standard space and most of the element that they require will be required in this standard. So the, 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 the point that I want to make here is that there is a risk, I mean, for company, for, I mean, these standards will come. They will arrive in two years in Europe and probably also very soon at the international level too. And clearly today we have noticed in this experimentation that they were not that I mean, easily uh, able to really provide the information required. The second, the second lesson is that, on the other hand, companies were quite keen to, con to discuss and participate to the conversation with us when we were putting on the table some long-term strategy, deep decarbonization pathways. Clearly, the engagement was quite fine. I mean, they wanted to really try to learn and see what they, wh how they could also create more capacity on the different dimensions. Please, next slide. And I will not detail this, this slide and go very, very quickly to then engage more in the, in, the, in the panel and the discussion. But these are a bit our messages on what to not miss. I'm, I'm telling this because what we are seeing is that very often detailed transition plans are, you know, covering many modules, many indicators, and so on. And sometimes we, l we miss the elephant in the room. We miss, like, the big topic. And, okay, we look, you know, on the side, and this element is good, this one is good, but the elephant in the room is not addressed. So, clearly, uh, for me and for us, the elephant in the room is that when discussing with company on their transition plans, the core sector of their activity, so the transformations uh, of their core activity, which means uh, that they, they, sh they need to tell us what are the vision of their existing and future business markets, what is actually the transition of their existing assets, how they see also the future new investment in production assets. This is like the scope one type of emission. This is what we should not miss and not be fine, let's say, with uh, information that are provided on their uh, policy engagement with suppliers or clients. I mean, it's part of the big picture, that's true. I'm mentioning it in the second point, but 
we should focus and be sure that these transition plans are tackling the first, the first element here. And then I'm just providing, but I will not detail it, some of the elements that we used directly in the method, like we want to know their investment, capex, we want to know what is their also investment in terms of R&D to understand where they are putting the money. We also want to know their service procurement because they, they think you know more from a financial perspective on their operational expenditures so we want to know where they are uh, having expenditures in transport packaging all these let's say connected uh, other activities that are not their core business but they have a role they can incentive through these expenditures also the transformation of this other sector so um, I, will, I will stop here on this slide, just finishing by saying uh, that's th the message in red. is <laughs> like we should pay attention to not be focused too much on optimization of existing system and really be able to discuss how we, mean we implement the structural systemic change, meaning when we were working on the power sector, meaning, okay, uh, you have a coal fire plant that is there. When is the end of the, I mean, when do you plan to end it and how do you go there? I mean, because in, in, the, in the future, you, you need to set a date and we need to be clear on it. So that's the type of element that we should not miss in such discussion and not be uh, okay with, uh, with other elements. Next slide, please. And the last element I wanted to mention is the link, of course, with uh, national deep decarbonization pathways. I think it's, uh, it's quite central. The, for two reasons. First, I mean, today, if you, if you look at uh, corporate transition plans, very often the reference scenario they are using are the IA, are global benchmark, global scenario at best, some regional one. But why is that important to assess their progress on the national basis? This is for these two reasons. First, is that clearly on working on national deep decarbonization pathways at the national level, will enable to discuss the set of action that needs to be implemented and to still keep in mind that one of the main uh, level for sovereignty and for action is at this level. The second point is for me fundamental. When a company is saying, yeah, I'm Paris aligned. For me, Paris aligned has many meaning. One of them is the common but differentiated responsibilities. And clearly, a way to approach this question is to enter by having national deep decarbonization pathways that recognize different paths, that recognize different country specificities. And we believe that this is a way also to engage with companies on this question of being Paris aligned or this dimension of being of what mean being Paris aligned. And I will, I will skip a bit the others that was just presenting how we can see it from an opportunity uh, point of view for companies and what they can get from this uh, these aspect of cooperation or uh, getting information from the national circumstances. And I will just uh, say that clearly we have been tested this combined approach of um, discussing sexual transition in the country, so putting clearly the companies on board saying this is where we want to go and these are the scenario we'll use then to assess if you are aligned with and then combining it with the assessment of their transition plans and we found that these two tools uh, clearly were uh, one of the conditions if we really want that they are useful and they are connected was the capacity to connect on the underlying transformation. So what I said about connecting the capex with the real physical asset, connecting the uh, operational expenditures with uh, the transport expenditures and the transition of the transport sector at the same time. So being able to really make the, the, the concrete connection with the, the sexual transformation. And last slide, please. And if you want to learn more <laughs> about this project, so that's the, that's the website here. We have done a lot uh, in it. So we have designed methods. Uh, we have produced scenarios. So our colleague from Brazil and Mexico are not there uh, uh, today from the, the DDP side, but we have produced so scenarios uh, of transition in these two countries. And of course, we have conducted, and, and maybe uh, uh, Rebecca will also say a word or express that, but with CDP Latin America and ADEM that are uh, in the ACT initiative, they have conducted a lot of engagement with the private stakeholders. They have assessed around 10 companies in Brazil and 10 companies in Mexico, and all these information are public on the website here. And last slide, just to say 
thank you. <laughs> thank you for your attention. And now I will move directly to uh, uh, the panel discussion. I will invite Rebecca uh, Lima, Executive Director of CDP Latin America, to join and take a seat. And normally online, we should have uh, Emily Castro, uh, that is uh, MRV Senior Technical Manager from the Science Based Target Initiative. I don't know if we are able to, to see her. Yes, great. Hi, Emily. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Works good, perfect. So then I will uh, directly start with a simple, quite simple question. I, I would like that you, uh, you introduce just yourself, the role of your institution also in, in when discussing about uh, transition, uh, transition plans and of course your activity linked to it. So maybe uh, I will uh, pass you the floor first, Rebecca, to, uh, to start. Can I stand up? So because it's only me um, here in the fandom, so I'll stand up. If it is okay with you, Emily. Uh, so I start just presenting myself. My name is Rebecca Lima. I'm executive director for CDP in Latin America. For those of you that don't know, CDP is a nonprofit organization that works for more than 20 years, promoting uh, disclosure and transparency from no state actors, mainly uh, companies, cities, states, and regions. And you basically ask them to disclose what they are doing in terms of uh, mitigating and, adap and adapting to climate change and other environmental issues. So in terms of directly what we do uh, regarding transition plan, when CDP asks the stakeholders to disclose uh, on climate, we are not only talking about JJ emissions and how they're setting targets, but how they are preparing the entire organization in order to really commit to this target, which includes governance, includes transition plans. And currently we have more than uh, around 25 KPIs regarding transition plans that we also require companies to disclose on. So uh, Ian um, actually already gave some of our data, the data was pretending to do, that's um, around one third of the companies that already disclose to CDP, the biggest one, the listed ones, they already have a transition plan. Uh, this is a way of looking at it. Like, they already have, but there's another one third I plan to have a transition plan in the next two years. And for us, as CDP, we see the transition plan as a critical tool uh, that will enable all the stakeholders to understand uh, that this organization, this company, has, is really committed to uh, achieve the target. Um, overall, uh, because I know we'll discuss the topic further afterwards. Uh, t thanks, Rebecca. And uh, Emily, please. Oi, why didn't come in? I, got, I just got a call now. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I am I'm Emily Castro. I, am, uh, I work for the Science Based Target Initiative, but I am actually hosted by CDP. Uh, the Science Based Target Initiative is a collaboration of uh, five partners of uh, CDP, World Resources Institute, Worldwide Fund, UN Global Compact and Women Business. And it was created in 2015 and since, since its creation, uh, the SBTI has focused on developing, uh, developing methods and guidance on how to set science-based targets aligned with, uh, with Paris Agreement in a range of sectors, but also uh, for different actors, including now uh, not only corporates, but also financial institutions and small and medium enterprises. And actually, we have become like the de facto climate uh, climate ambition standard in, in the corporate sector, with now over 4,000 businesses that are representing around one third of the global market, the global market capitalization, uh, and that have these companies that have been committed uh, to set science-based target. And from these uh, 4,000, around 1,900 have been uh, validated uh, their targets with the, with the initiative. And how we are connected with the transition plans is that any credible transition plan as one of the key elements is to have uh, science-based targets in place. Uh, and well, so that's actually well, what, what we do. And we have uh, options for uh, validating near-term targets, but also long-term and net-zero targets. And maybe just to also frame the, the, the project I am working on uh, that relates, relates as well with, um, with transition planning is that as the SHI uh, is growing, 
uh, we find it also critical to uh, expand our accountability, but also our incentive structure to provide mm -hmm. more certainty uh, to, this, to the investors and also to our stakeholders. Um, um, like what companies that, that companies are not only setting credible targets but also they are effectively decarbonizing in line with science and the targets remain valid over time and ultimately and ultimately that the targets have achieved their their goal so those numbers that you present before presented before Jan about like uh, the, 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 that we're tracking the companies on how they are performing. This is something that we want to, to improve with the development of uh, me, uh, measurement reporting and verification framework uh, and moving our, our scope of work from uh, the ambition, the, the certification and the ambition to the certification of the delivery of the, of the target. So just framing there mm. what is also the aim of the MRB project. T thank you, and, and I think it's it's quite important that that everyone notice, and and it's uh, I will come back to you directly, Emily, because it's quite new. I've, I think we we said like science-based target is a, a first step setting this uh, this target, but uh, clearly you were telling uh, you are in a new team that has been created in, in the science-based target initiative to try to, I mean, the measurement, reporting, verification to try to indeed try to ensure that these targets are advancing and that the companies are really implementing them. So maybe can you, as I know, the team is quite n new. I mean, it has been, uh, yeah, this is a new, new group. C can, you, can you tell us how you see the challenges for, let's say, moving from this setting targets mode to really delivering the targets? I know it's a bit your motto, if I'm, if I'm right. Yes, well, we know that the challenges are, are huge and I think that they would vary a lot depending on the sector we are focusing on and the type of actor. But well, we can see also, uh, not only from the target perspective, but also for the transition planning perspective, that we see companies that are lacking from clearing, uh, from having a clear delivery roadmap, that they have financial constraints for uh, implementing, uh, implementing measures for reducing emissions, or not making like clear business case for the decarbonization investment. And, and here, I think one of the main challenges that we, we, we know already, what we are hearing more and more, is around the, the supply, the, the, the decarbonization of the, of the supply chain. And these are uh, emissions that represent over 70% of the GHG inventories of companies. And actually, when we uh, when we see our our portfolio of targets, we have 96% of companies that have set uh, scope three emission targets. So this is uh, quite a focus uh, for us. And uh, we ran recently a survey uh, that covered different topics, but also uh, scope three challenges. And specifically, and I just want to share with you, like the the outcomes of this of the survey around the scope three challenges is that uh, around 50% of the respondents that, uh, that answered to this, to this survey, they, they, they say, or they self-reported that they are off track of meeting their scope three targets. Then they also find that it is more challenging to implement measures in two specific sectors, which is the, uh, in the upstream, the category one, the purchase goods and services, and in the in downstream, the category 11, which are use of sold products. And the specific and well, these two these two categories are quite relevant actually because they represent above like seventy percent of uh, the scope three emissions mm, reported regularly from companies at least in from the CDP uh, from the CDP questionnaire. Then uh, the top the top challenges that, uh, that they have shared about delivery is uh, how they can influence the upstream suppliers, how they can influence the customers, uh, the cost of the carbonization, the ability to track progress towards the target due to insufficient access of primary data, but also due to lack of knowledge or lack of understanding what really counts towards the target. And this specific part is where the project also wants to work on not only the MRV project, but also we're uh, starting a scope three, a specific scope three, three project that will help uh, providing better, uh, better methodologies for setting targets in the scope three sector. 
but also by providing more guidance to the companies, like what is that what counts towards the achievement of targets, which sometimes it is not uh, it is not completely completely clear in terms of divestment, purchasing of renewable energy, uh, forest land use, and agricultural interventions, changes in their uh, emission factors, insetting, etc. So. There are uh, like a, ling a long, long list of challenges. We are trying to, to deal with this uh, through the development of this project, but also providing more guidance specific uh, that, that uh, responds to this demand of, our, of the companies that are part of the initiative. Thank you, uh, Emily, and, and I will uh, I will ask you the, the if you want uh, the, the the same Rebecca, but I will move directly because I, I I'm seeing the time. I will also make the two a bit together, so I will ask you also a bit the the, the question after, and you can maybe come try to to combine because I feel it's it's also going together. I mean, this question was about how, what are the challenges from moving setting targets, you know, to delivering targets. But the the other question I had was. I mentioned like the dimension to not miss if we want to ensure that they are delivering targets. So what are also the elements maybe from your experience that you, you have seen in the, in the project and that you would like to share? But please answer the, answer the both of them. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll try to answer both of them. For the first one, uh, of course, I agree with, with our colleague Emily uh, in a lot of aspects, but I just would like to add some. Um, aspects to it but before that I just would like to uh, recap like what transition plan is in our view so uh, the setting a target or a science-based targets is the what and a transition plan is the how so it's really important to understand uh, that transition plan uh, should come along with the target so it makes sense like the challenges that are explained to you so when we we saw the data that you presented. We have uh, 1,400 companies committed to, to science-based targets. And if I'm not mistaken, Emily can correct me. They all together, uh, all the targets combined, aim to reduce their emissions for at least 90% by 2050. And a lot of these companies, as was said before, uh, rely on their scope three emissions and supply chain uh, engagement in order to do that. So when you think about it, the target is reducing emissions, but in terms of the how, one of the main challenges is how to engage the supply chain in order for their, um, this supply ch the suppliers also reduce their emissions so they can meet their own targets. So supply chain engagement is definitely one of the main challenges when you think about scalability uh, and achievement uh, of this uh, commitments, but also um, in our perspective, in the transition plan, it should be clear how the company will be adapting its business model and financial planning in order to actually deliver the target. So this is another challenge as well, because uh, from the corporate perspective, you need to engage with the cross departments, uh, including having your CFO on the table and CEO and, and board, and that's where governance comes into place. So you can really adapt and prove that your business model and your finance planning would be still robust and reliable even uh, from two perspectives. One, in order to deliver the target, and the second is even with delivering and reducing emissions, it will still be like a very robust organization from the investment perspective. Um, and the last challenge that I'd like to highlight, as Emily said, there are several, so I had to, to pick up some of them, uh, relates to uh, public policy, especially among some specific sectors that we know rely a lot on public policy in order to deliver the goals and change behavior. So just to mention some of them, like energy, for instance, like even with having targets, if you're in the, in the energy sector, there's a lot you have to do in terms of engaging with public policy, with regulations, and then um, policy engagement has a really important role to play as well. In terms of the miss, uh, so if you just launched a report, it was mentioning uh, mentioned on, on Ian's presentation, and uh, honestly, there's a really long list of don't miss. But um, I would like to personally highlight some of them, which should be governance. Uh, I've been working for CDP for six years and with corporate engagement and corporations, and if it's anything is not 
intrinsically embedded on the governance of any corporation, it won't move forward. And by governance, I mean like, yes, yeah, C-level being engaged on this and the board of directors and knowing what it is and like how the company structure its governance in order to deliver um, this target and the transition plan. Financial planning, as I already said, is really relevant, it's really critical, not only that I uh, ensure I'll have a robust business model and financial planning to my stakeholder, but also that the business model, the financial planning that I'm uh, setting up, they uh, set me up for success in terms of achieving, uh, achieving uh, the target, which means I'm actually uh, driving capital, internal capital, towards uh, my target, including innovation or whatever transition activities I have already mapped to implement in my organization. And lastly, just to say, as I already said, uh, the supply engagement, I won't expand on this because we're explained. Um, it might be uh, something that may appear to be simple to some supply chains, to some sectors, but it's definitely not. Thanks, thanks, Rebecca and and, uh, and and Emily. If you want to to add also uh, just a complementary example of what you feel are the one, two key elements in transition plans, please please feel free. Yeah, definitely. The governance that it's already covered, but what I want to to add is also focusing on interim targets. So establishing interim targets to make things more uh, tangible is very very relevant. So that is one point. And uh, the other one that I, that I think it is uh, supporting the GAG overarching target with non-emission-based uh, non, non uh, metrics as well, KPIs that are, uh, that, are able, that we can be able to, to measure, report, and verify is something that, that is key. So having a robust mechanism for tracking because whatever is done, if it is not measured, we cannot really know, it. we cannot ensure that it is that it's occurring. So in, in terms of that, and you, I think you already presented them in the, in the slide, in, in one of your slides, business and operational metrics, financial metrics, and internal governance metrics, setting as targets and KPIs that can be followed. For me, it is something quite, quite important. And in terms of GAG uh, accounting practices, follow the best practices there. GAG protocol, res uh, recalculation of your base year emissions once uh, there is a structural change, because we have to al also compare from what we started to be the same thing or to compare like with like. So if there are changes, after some time, we have to be able to be to ensure that we are uh, that these changes, if they are structural, that they that there there was a modification of the base year of the of the targets, and not only in terms of emissions, but also in other in other uh, in other metrics that that could be influenced. So that for me, those are also key elements. Th thanks, Emily, and, and I will uh, just f finish with the last, uh, but. Uh, very short, like one sentence uh, answer to this point. So you have maybe you had maybe.